Hello and good evening and welcome to you all tonight. It's great to see so many people with us and I'm really thrilled to be introducing our new series with Rathbones as well as our new series with Q. We're delighted to be working with Rathbones again after our fantastic Earth Convention series last year, which lots of you tuned into. But it's also a really, really big pleasure to be going forward with our collaboration with Q because we've done some fantastic events with them. This time around, we're going to be looking at the twin diversity loss, which we did before, but we're going to look at some slightly different angles, as you're going to see tonight. Um, coming up, for instance, is going to be the effect of colonialism on the type of botanic fauna and flora that we have in this country. And it's one hell of a story, as I'm sure you can imagine. We're kicking off tonight though, with a big bang. Some of you may already know that Q has been running a festival over the last few weeks, and its, its theme is queer nature, with exhibits that explore the diversity and the beauty of plants, and particularly of fungi, and demonstrate some of their fascinating connections between the plants and the fungi and our own LGBTQ plus communities. That has been a hugely successful exhibition and Q have been thrilled and really keen for people to know that they've still got another two weeks. Audience numbers have been fantastic and the reaction from the guests has really surpassed all their expectations. The theme pro has provided that idea behind tonight's topic and which all our four wonderful speakers are going to be addressing. It's certainly true that as human beings, we really like to pigeonhole things. We like square fields, which are easy for tractors. We like things in categories. We like to know things where things are, that they've got numbers and indexes. And well, you know what I mean. We're a sort of precise lot and it makes us feel safer. But in fact, of course, nature is wildly different to that. Where nature doesn't have fixed categories. It isn't binary. It's much more chaotic in the best senses of that word. Everything about these incredible organisms demands a kind of nuance. And personally, I think there's an awful lot that we as human beings can learn about how we coexist with each other in a much more tolerant and open way. And that's really going to be a big theme of tonight. So a couple of bits of how it's going keeping everyone who's familiar with 5 by 15 will know this, so I'll be speedy. We have four speakers, they're going to speak for max five minutes each, then we're all going to have a chat among ourselves and then we'll take your questions. So don't delay about putting your questions in. When you think of them, just stick them in the Q&A box and I'll try my very best to get to as many as I can. So on to our first speaker, who is so great to have John Dory back with 5 by 15, joining us from somewhere in the States, I'm not sure where. John is a trustee of the Eden Project at Cambridge University Botanic Gardens. He was also a trustee at Kew and an ambassador for the Woodland Trust and the WWF. You probably know him best as the author of Around the World in 80 Trees and Around the World in 80 Plants, which rather fantastically Kew also sell as a jigsaw puzzle of the cover, which I think is a very, very amazing um, Everest to have climbed in terms of books and jigsaws. I'm very jealous. Um, tonight, he's going to be kicking us off by talking about some of the insights into the diversity of plant life and fungal and their reproduction and their sexuality. So, John, thank you and over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm in New York at the moment, so excuse the sort of whoop, whoop of, uh, of background uh, sirens. Now, human beings can express their sexuality in, uh, and, and the outward signs of, of gender in all sorts of delightful ways. Um, at different points in history, uh, people have kind of, uh, fashion has come in and out for the way they express those. Um, but in humans, at least, one aspect is rather set, and that is the ability to reproduce is based on having X and Y chromosomes, uh, which need to sort of get together. Trees and plants don't have their gender fixed in the same way, in the same genetic way uh, as we do. And I remember as a teenager at, uh, at Kew having a, a gloriously awkward conversation with my parents about this, who insisted on, uh, on telling me all about the um, uh, gender fluidity of uh, not just of plants, but of people as well, uh, in front of uh, a whole load of other people. It was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Um, let me see if I can make this work. And 
uh, perhaps someone should, could just tell me that that's okay. Uh, okay, well, I, I'll assume that you can see. Um, yes, it's good, John. Uh, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, a, a quick rundown of how plants reproduce. Um, uh, effectively, there are three ways. Uh, you can reproduce asexually. In other words, you sort of take a cutting of yourself or, or have a runner or, a, or whatever. These aspens on the left, those are they're all clones of each other. Um, and they tend to reproduce uh, vegetatively, uh, sort of effectively, a, a, a sort of a runner comes out and, and sort of sprouts a new plant. Um, the plant on the right is a banana flower, and you'd think something with a flower like that um, would be very, very sexual indeed. Uh, but in fact, we've bred bananas not to have seeds, and uh, so the way that bananas are uh, are cultivated and reproduce is by uh, cloning them vegetatively, by taking a cutting effectively. And that makes uh, these plants very vulnerable to disease because if one is vulnerable, they all will be because they're all related. They're all twins, effectively. Um, I'm trying to uh, go to my next slide and it's, uh, there we go. Uh, so uh, the other way of uh, reproducing is uh, sexually and flowering plants do this with pollen. Uh, there's an alder catkin. Um, they throw out loads to the wind, or some have a better way of doing it, which is uh, to uh, have a go-between, take their pollen, which contains the male sex cells, uh, to the female parts of, uh, of a flower. Um, but uh, it's not quite as simple as uh, the, uh, the human beings and the date palms, which have male and female plants. So very few plants in um, uh, in nature actually reproduce with a male plant and a female plant. Uh, date, dates are one of the few, um, uh, hops, kiwi fruit. Um, and the reason that uh, human beings get away with it is because it's quite useful to have a male around to kind of help look after the baby. Uh, but for, um, for, you know, once the male uh, plant has done its bit in, in a date uh, uh, plantation. Uh, there's not much else for the date, uh, the male date plant to do. It doesn't bear fruit. Um, so uh, most plants, uh, oh, and they're, they're on the left of the uh, male male flowers and the, and the female ones on, on the right. So most plants are a bit more like tomatoes. Uh, they can have uh, sex. If, they, if there's one tomato plant uh, surrounded by 10 others, it can have promiscuous sex with those 10 other plants and in fact can also have promiscuous sex with itself. Uh, it's hermaphrodite, um, which is uh, a, a jolly handy thing to be if times are hard and you can't find another plant to pollinate with, uh, then you can sort of generate from yourself. So they're, they're her hermaphrodite. And then we've got the wonderful world of avocados. Avocado in uh, Nahuatl, which is the uh, indigenous language, actually means testicle, and I think you can see why that might be. Um, but they, uh, avocados come in two types, type A and type B, let's call them that. And uh, in the morning, all the type A plants will open their flowers, and the flowers are all female. And in the afternoon, uh, after a bit of a snooze at lunchtime, those same flowers will be male. Um, and if you have two lots of avocados, A type and B type, um, they exactly reverse that timing. Uh, so that means that they, uh, they, they get the advantage of sexual reproduction, which uh, makes them less vulnerable to disease and more able to cope with environmental change um, uh, uh, by sort of uh, the insects flitting between the plants of the type A and the type B that are open at the same time. Very clever, stops self-fertilization. Of course, when we've got big plantations of avocados um, that, uh, that of one kind, that doesn't work. And so we clone the plants and again, uh, they're vulnerable. And then we've got the fantastic ash tree, the wonder of the British countryside, uh, sadly threatened at the moment by a fungal disease. Um, there are the seeds that you've all seen. Um, uh, there's the male flowers, the female flowers, um, but uh, this is a, a plant that can uh, change from uh, male to female throughout its life. Uh, that it, Sometimes there'll be a male branch on a tree and sometimes a female branch and they'll swap over. Uh, it's absolutely gender fluid, gender bending. Um, and this is one of our most common trees. 
Uh, and I, I love the fact that it's something that is in every uh, hedgerow around the countryside and uh, constantly changing, uh, changing its gender. I'll stop there um, with just the thought, really, that, um, you know, nature, uh, yes, in order to reproduce, they need, uh, you know, human beings need X and Y chromosomes. Uh, but in the way that we express our uh, sexuality and our attraction to others and so on, um, I think we can learn a lot from uh, from the lovely ash tree. Jonathan, that was fantastic. Thank you. I've got so many questions for you, not the least of which I'll leave you to think about. Where do you think, even if we hadn't gotten the way as man, I wonder where evolution was heading towards just being a sort of solo, solo person that, that sounds so efficient. And as you say, men hanging around being useless. Well, let, let's talk about that later. Now, I'm very, very pleased to introduce our next speaker, who comes indeed from Q, which is wonderful, Bat Maria Varontsova. She is a researcher at Q, and she studies grasses, which actually, if you look at her picture behind her, you can see lots of wonderful, wonderful grasses, which I imagine, Bat, are the things that you look after and study. Your particular focus is on tropical African diversity and evolutionary history and the history and of the history of tropical grasslands and savannas. By describing and classifying these herbarian species, Bat's work at Kew enriches our understanding of all their ecosystems as well as their function. So Bat, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Um, so the slide that you can hopefully see now has the magic power of putting all my students to sleep, usually in under one minute. Um, many people think that not many things are quite as boring as taxonomy and classifying things into species. Uh, so our system for naming plants officially dates back to 1753. Um, Carl Linnaeus tabulated and described um, quite a number of plant species. And as you hopefully can see on the side of my slide, um, he divided, well, actually he summarized work done by many people before him, where every species had a Latin name, every species has a genus and the species epithet, and they're distinguished by simple set of morphological characteristics. Um, so the students are all asleep at this point, why? Because we assume it's ever so obvious. It was done in 1753. Nature's diversity comes in a nice clear-cut set of boxes. Um, Rosie, as you correctly pointed out in the introduction. Um, so why does the world need taxonomists? And why are we rehashing this diversity over and over again? Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so this is a working example, actually, from my postdoctoral research on the African spiny wild aubergines. And if I could see everybody in person here in front of me, I would be asking you, how many species do you think you can see on this slide? Um, so these are all original botanical drawings um, created by our artist Lucy Smith to illustrate my taxonomic work in Q. Um, Probably most people would think there are at least 10 different species depicted on this slide. And I have to tell you that after studying these plants every day, full time for three years, I put all of these specimens inside one species. You will see on the map that the species Selenum compilacanthum has quite a broad distribution range all the way from northeastern Africa, all the way down from South Africa. So the ones with kind of more narrow leaves and more spines tend to occur in South Africa more often. And the ones with broader leaves occur further north a little bit more often. There is no cutoff point. Nobody understands why this happens. Nobody has ever looked at the genetics and genomics and the evolution of the species in a lot of detail. And what I'm telling you now is sadly actually very typical for tropical plants and also happens for temperate plants as well, where there's an almost infinite diversity of forms and shapes. So 
because back in the Victorian times, the system has told us that things come in species. This assumption originally comes actually from zoology. So the majority of animals, um, populations interbreed. The, the fact that multiple populations interbreed keeps one species distinct from other species. Historically, the discipline of botany and discipline of mycology, everything tends to lag behind zoology a little bit because there's a tendency for people to study themselves first, then we study animals, and only then do we consider things like plants. So a lot of assumptions from zoology tend to be carried over to botany kind of automatically. Um, so taxonomists like me, um, I spend my days in Kew Herbarium looking at many, many, many specimens. And actually, many people are shocked that we still use pretty much the same methodology Linnaeus used 200, 250 years ago, except we now have more specimens. So I spread literally hundreds of dead plant specimens in front of me. And I think, how does biodiversity change over space? Is my morphology in continuous distributions or does my morphology form sort of discrete clumps? Then I kind of scratch my head a little bit and I go for a drink and I get a bit stressed and I think, oh God, this is completely continuous variation. Therefore, I have to call it a species. Nothing, no advance has really been made on this system simply because it's so convenient. We, we have no choice but label organisms using Latin names because all of the human knowledge about organisms and associated with these organisms has been associated with these same Latin names for 250 years. It's a convenient cataloging system. It does not reflect true diversity. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so this next example is about the current work I'm doing in Madagascar, where I've been studying the diversity of Madagascar grasses. And at the front of this slide, you can see kind of a brownish, ordinary looking grass, uh, brown panicles um, called Ludicia simplex. It's the most common grass which covers most of the open ecosystem highlands across Madagascar. So again, one would assume it has a single Latin name and therefore it's one species, except it's always a bit confusing because when we look at the literature, there are five different synonyms that have been coined in the past for the same species from different parts of Madagascar and also from different parts of South Africa. Um, so the map that you see on my slide is a result of genetic research that we did. We went and collected the species from different parts of Madagascar, different parts of South Africa. We sequenced them and we counted their chromosomes. So as many of you I'm sure know, people and most organisms have two copies of every gene. Um, and if you look at the nuclear part of the slide, these grasses, some of them have six copies, some of them have four copies, and some of them have two copies, just like people. So this is one illustration of how this incredible diversity within species hides without being recognized. Um, many plant species complex. It's a kind of a convenient word, species complex. It's what we say of Frank White and Oxford many years ago called it Oclo species. We don't need to use the complicated words are just there to hide the fact that diversity is a bit messy and we don't know what it is. And for economically unimportant plants like the ones I'm showing you today, nobody has made the effort to study why this queer diversity is there, what is their history, and how it comes about. Um, so organisms swap genes over space. When bits of DNA from one ends up inside the other, the scientific word for that is introgression. There are all kinds of complicated reproductive systems, which for majority of tropical plants, nobody has analyzed. Um, so maybe I will finish here for today and just I want to remind you next time you see a Latin plant name, just think how much weird and exciting diversity is hiding behind this single Latin name. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Pat. That was very illuminating. Um, and 
Yes, uh, it, it's just this one kind of fear, you know, the extreme classification. Um, our next speaker is Luke Turner, who, whose second book was called Men at War, and this was a very critically acclaimed account of masculinity and sexuality during the Second World War. He's the co-founder of online music and arts magazine, The Quietus, and he's contributed to just about every newspaper that you're ever going to read. But he's here tonight because his first book was called Out of the Woods, which was a, member, a, a memoir about desire and faith and an exploration of human identity within nature, focusing a lot on London's Epping Forest. This book was shortlisted for the Wainwright Prize. So he's going to be telling us about this book and about the well, how he came to write it. So, Luke, over to you for your five minutes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rosie. So this is my knackered old proof copy of Out of the Woods that has been with me for four years now. Um, and I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the book, but also maybe how some of the reflections in it have changed since I wrote it. Uh, it's about 10 years now, I think, since I started writing it. So it's been quite a journey. So if is this is working, hopefully everyone can see this old map of Epping Forest. Um, oops, sorry. I just, let me just uh, make sure that doesn't uh, do that when we don't want it to. So this is Epping Forest. I'm not sure if people are uh, familiar. We're on the other side of London um, from Kew. Uh, Epping Forest stretches from Forest Gate in uh, at the East End all the way out uh, past about 200 metres for where I'm sitting now, out into the Epping countryside. Um, I planned to write a social history of Epping Forest uh, and an artistic history of Epping Forest uh, and a bit about my family because we come from Epping Forest. But then as I started writing the book, uh, my life was a bit of a mess and it ended up becoming a memoir, uh, but also a bit of a critique and an exploration of our human relationship with nature and, and just trying to muddle that up somewhat. This is a lopping ceremony that happened about this time every year um, when people would exercise their ancient rights uh, in the Royal Forest of Epping Forest to lop wood from the trees for firewood. Um, it was said that Epping Forest fueled the bread ovens of London. Um, and it was there was a, a campaign in the 19th century to save Epping Forest, which was being felled um, and danger of being felled. And it united everybody uh, in London from the very poorest people around Epping Forest who would have participated in this ceremony to the aristocracy. Um, and I think that it offers a lot of uh, um, uh, sort of example of what we can do now in the fight against climate change. Now, Epping Forest was always a very human uh, place. Uh, when I was writing the book, I was in a state of quite severe depression and I absorbed a lot of nature cure ideas a lot of forest bathing ideas that you go into nature and it will cure you um and I, it wasn't working for me and that's really what was at the heart of out of the woods was unpicking this idea that there's a transactional thing that can happen that when you go into nature that is separate from humans and it will make you feel better now this just was not working at all and since i published the book it's been very interesting people coming up to me and saying thank you for writing that because when i go to a wood because my friends tell me to it will cure my depression I feel overwhelmed and I have to leave and go back home. And I think instead, I, I, what I emerged was that Epic Forest was full of these incredible human stories. The archive was just was just rammed with all these bonkers tales of political agitation, unlicensed preaching, illegal gherkin selling, poaching, boxing, uh, children trampled by a donkey derby gone out of control, biker rallies, crazy Aunt Sally's. All sorts of just really, really strange behaviour that wasn't like this this standard idea of nature as this sort of place which doesn't have people in it that will cure ourselves. And that continues today. Here's uh, from one, on one walk, just a few things I spotted. Um, I worked on a sound installation in the forest and we did a uh, ecological survey of a 30 by 40 metre square of the forest to find out what species live there. And as well as an incredible diversity of species, we found uh, booze containers stretching back to the 19th century. We found condom wrappers. We found underwear. We found discarded children's toys. And sort of quite sadly, we found a medical box of hypodermic needles behind a tree where obviously a heroin addict went to use drugs. And it really struck me that even in this tiny transept of the forest, all of this was still going on, as well as the nature that was happening there too. 
Uh, I come here, someone has carved into the tree. Now, this isn't in one of Epping Forest's many gay cruising areas, um, but I, I kind of quite like this sort of defiant, rather bawdy statement carved into the bark. Um, the book coincided with me trying to work out my sexuality. I'd grown up always wondering if I was gay or straight and why I couldn't make my mind up as both heterosexual and homosexual culture in the 90s when I was a kid told me to do. And um, I, I, I was in a, a process of trying to understand who I really was. Uh, and queer cruising spaces were, were something that has always, had always been part of my life from a, a young age to detrimental um, effect. And some terrible things happened to me when I was younger that I write about in the book. But then I'd also loved what Derek Jarman wrote about Hampstead Heath, another place saved for the citizens of London by the Corporation of London um, and the cruising spaces there. And I just found these very interesting places as as places of queer liberation where men who were not able to be out could go to be themselves, to find sexual release, companionship. But they were also very complicated. Some of the people going there would be cheating on their families. For others, it would still be a shameful place. Uh, and how did it impact on other forest users? And I thought that this was a really interesting way of looking into forests as these sort of sexualized places and queer spaces. And the pollards, uh, as we saw at the, the start of this little talk, uh, people cutting the trees for firewood gives them this very gnarly, strange look as the uh, as they're cut repeatedly, new branches grow. And they used to be cut on a 15 year cycle. And pollarding uh, of beaches and hornbeams, primarily in Epping Forest, is actually very good for the trees. It prolongs their lives. Um, some of the uh, pollards in Epping Forest are hundreds and hundreds of years old. And I, and I felt that this sort of idea of uh, a pollarded, complicated tree really spoke to me as, as somebody who grew up with a fluid identity, um, that it, it disrupted this idea of nature over there, beautiful tall trees and humans over here. It was this place of symbiosis between humans and nature that I found really exciting. And strangely, this sort of ancient woodland process uh, really spoke to me around queer identity as well. And you can see here what happens if you don't do any pollarding. Um, this is a very ancient pollard, it's now dead. Uh, behind it, the forest has rewilded itself, which has means it's become very dense. And the ecologists I spoke to writing the book were talking about how once a forest uh, isn't managed, um, the actual biodiversity can decrease. Um, similarly, here you have some pollards, which look very beautiful. This was taken at dawn in, in Loughton. And you can see where the pollards, uh, they've stopped pollarding. The beech trees have grown up and they've shut out the light. So all you really get below is leaf mold and holly. And I just thought this really symbolizes how if we work with nature and things wood, with woodland, ancient woodland management and pollarding, we can have these very diverse spaces um, where the human and uh, the arboreal are working and companionship. And at the Wait. same time, um, uh, just to, to say these people, uh, organization called the Epic Forest Heritage Trust work uh, both with managing the woodland, pollarding trees, but also bringing more diverse groups into Epic Forest as well from LGBT to uh, non-white minority groups as well. Thank you, Luke, sorry thank about you. the technical Don't problems. worry, thank you so much. I'm very glad we got your slides because they're beautiful and that is a lovely, lovely last picture. And, and the, the shapes of the trees, I agree, I've been there often, are quite magical. Um, our final speaker tonight joins us from Colombia. Uh, she's Bridget Batiste, and she's one of Colombia's most eminent scientists. I've known her for a long time, and it's completely thrilling to see her and have her with us. She's an expert in all matters related to the environment, and she's a leading expert in gender diversity. She was director for 10 years of the Alexander von Humboldt uh, Biological Resources Research Institute, and she currently serves as the chancellor of the Universidad Ian, which is a higher education institution focused on sustainable entrepreneurship. Uh, Brigitte is an amazing uh, woman. She is an amazing traveler. She's an amazing advocate for all things to do with diversity, including the way she lives her own life, as you'll see. And uh, I think she's very brave and very remarkable. And uh, um, Brigitte, welcome. Thank you, Rossi. Thank you for the opportunity. I come to relations to Kew Garden and Radbone for this exhibition. I would love to visit you and, and talk a bit about what's going on at the London this 
uh, months. But uh, while it happens, I would li love to talk a bit about the cultural ways we used to analyze and define nature. I'm not a, bot a botanist myself. I, I used to be a, an ecologist of uh, fish ecologies, river ecologies, then landscape ecology, so keep uh, the scale uh, growing. Uh, but always thinking on how our way of seeing things and defining things create reality. And particularly here in Colombia, with such an amazing diversity, plant diversity, we have more than 27,000 species of plants, where you can guess it. it's impossible to just to, uh, classify uh, with the, the, the traditional tools of Linnaeus. And, and even if we try, we can clump things here and then uh, we can uh, split uh, fungus from, from plants, of course, uh, with some trees, families, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the different kinds of uh, behaviors of plants. But uh, what happens if you think that this uh, way of seeing biodiversity is just uh, a device that was brought to Colombia by uh, modern science and scientists such as Linnaeus, which uh, was mentioned, and, and his uh, colleagues, which uh, did a very good job here in Colombia, uh, classifying and, and collecting plants for Kew Garden uh, as well in the 19th century. Uh, what happened if uh, other cultures define other tools to see what plants are, or what are the, the, the if there are different kinds of beings in the world. And then you get to ayahuasca, for example, uh, which is the tool that uh, many indigenous groups here in, in, in the tropics use to approach nature. It's uh, a way of modifying perception and uh, creating different types of relationships with plants and animals, of course, and the world. Uh, in, in, in the, while you drink this, uh, um, this vine, you start to have perhaps dreams, perhaps hallucinations, um, but also you start to talk with plants and plants you have seen at some point, you have experienced at some point with, and then you create an ecological relationship in your mind with those plants, um, giving them agency and, and acknowledging that they are more complex than just a, a Latin uh, identification. And that's the messy issue that uh, um, that uh, Maria mentioned uh, about about gender in plants and ecology. We don't understand how it works, but for those uh, indigenous groups, it's absolutely uh, simple. It's uh, a way of relating to other beings and have an experience with all other beings uh, with a, a different frame. So um, I think that the the, the most important thing of that is that plants uh, sometimes they have sex, they have uh, they, they, they have intercourse with people, uh, they reproduce in dreams with people, they teach you things, and, and uh, by doing so, you live in kind of in a different planet than uh, in modern science. So the problem is, or the issue is, how do you handle those? different systems of knowledge, uh, which is better and for what, if there's any practical uh, uh, application of this question. Um, it's best to define a plant with some indigenous cultural frame, or it's best to define it by modern science or within modern science by biochemistry, by genetics, by morphology. And uh, this is important because um, usually we um, create moral ideas about uh, nature. We think that nature is nice, is better, is uh, a good example for our social uh, behavior. And that's an idea from the 19th century, mostly the, the, the natural rights of things and that you should behave naturally. But if you define nature in, with different words, in, with different views, with different experiences, what it means to, uh, to uh, build moral uh, principles 
to derive um, ethical principles from behavior. Let's just see an example. The bumblebee that was fertilizing the tomato. It's just moving um, genes from a male flower to a female flower or within the same flower. But then if you think on morals, it's uh, a multiple species intercourse. So it's not that uh, uh, allowed in, in, in society to have an animal that helps you with your reproduction. It's uh, unthinkable, in fact. And then if you start thinking about parasites and about or weird behaviors of um, hyper parasites or other uh, animals and their relations with plants, then you start thinking that it's better not to be guided by nature, just to learn what is happening there, to build your identity in your own terms and not to rely on what nature, quote unquote, is trying to teach you. And, and I think it's the, uh, the most intriguing theme and think and disturbing thing of uh, queer ecology that it uh, suggests that um, we can uh, shift our identity as other beings in the world. It's a metaphor, an analogy, but also it has effects on anatomy, it has effects on morphology, behavior. We can choose the place in the ecosystem um, and we need to define new places in the ecosystem because we are destroying the world. So we need to move and to help other species to survive. Uh, we have to handle the world. But, and, and then our idea of nature uh, as a fixed thing, as an example, doesn't work. So we keep having this, uh, um, again, this, this challenge, with this uh, disturbing question about uh, what kind of nature do you think you live in? How this nature relates to you? How do you uh, think on yourself uh, or at yourself as part of nature? And how your sex and your evolution as a, uh, a material and organic being is affected by uh, these reflections? And then, of course, to jump into machines and the cyborgs and things like that that I'm not going to there here, but just uh, just leaving the last question about uh, the ideas of purity, uh, the ideas of universal knowledge that are challenged here, and the way we place ourselves in the world. Thank you, Brigitte. That was that was fantastic, and there was, actually that thrown up so many questions. I know I'm going to go around everybody to ask questions, and I hope you'll all ask questions of each other, but. Um, do you think that, I mean, when you talk about the, the kind of strangeness of the idea of the bee moving around the sexual organs, so to speak, on a tomato, and that actually that's very, that's pretty strange when you think about it. Do you think we were frightened? I mean, do you think that the desire to kind of put nature into Linnaean categories and try to sort of make it something other, that we were just frightened by the kind of power of it and the uh, magnificence? Oh, yes, I think so. Yeah, because you, you can really become many things at a time. You have, you, you have to accept that diversity rules and you're part of diversity and simplicity that you have used to position yourselves in society, to build your power, to build your identity, to build your capacities. Perhaps it's not the most important thing to, uh, to express or, or the way to be. So it, 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 uh, it launches lots of doubts about your legitimacy or your role in the world. And it, this is spooky. And the word we use for that is intersectionality. You are never just one thing. You are many, you have many identities embedded on yourself. And uh, how do we solve? How do you want to uh, manifest or to, to be perceived by others? That's a question of performance. And that's where the world now is becoming so wonderful. But it's spooky, of course. You need to decide many things. That's so interesting. Um, please put your questions in because we'll come to them in a, in a little bit, although I know we're running over a bit. But um, Jonathan, um, going back to that kind of question I asked you in, in terms of, do you think if, if we had not got in the way of evolution, whether evolution would have moved us more to being 
it, there's something extremely self-sufficient about being an ash tree. I mean, provided you don't get ash dieback, which obviously <laughs> is something that we have managed to produce. But an ash is just okay, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't need well, someone else. It doesn't need a bumblebee. It doesn't need the no, world no, to no, do it. Ash Ash trees are, um, uh, you know, cre create pollen and uh, the pollen is transferred partly by wind and partly by insects to, to other flowers. So there is sexual reproduction in an ash tree. It's just that the, um, uh, the which parts of the tree and which flowers, uh, you know, it's all a bit sort of uh, fluid about what, which gender is which. Um, the problem with, uh, you know, sort of having sex with yourself uh, which is kind of what you're suggesting, yeah. uh, is that it's a terrific way of recolonizing a space very fast. So those aspen trees, after a fire, they can just clone themselves. Um, when we want to have a plantation of avocados or bananas, we just take take a load of cuttings, stick them in, and uh, and they're all the same, and they grow very fast. And that's terrific, until a disease comes along. Um, and then any disease that hits one will hit them all. Now, the elm trees in, in Britain, uh, they succumbed uh, to, um, uh, to uh, Dutch elm disease. They particularly succumbed because even though they can do sexual reproduction, they actually tend to sort of do suckering better, uh, vegetative reproduction. And the variety that the Romans planted so they could grow their vines up them um, tend to be rather genetically similar. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a population without much variety in it, uh, and it succumbed to one particular disease. And this is what makes bananas so vulnerable, uh, because they're all clones. Um, you know, fungal disease will eventually wipe out the Cavendish banana that we that we have in the way that it wiped out previous ones, and we had to go to new varieties. In order to get the best possibility of defending yourself against uh, new diseases or climate change or environmental change as it comes along, you need to have that genetic diversity to mm -hmm. draw on, like a library of kind of, um, uh, of, of possibilities, so that um, when a bad thing happens, at least some of the kids, some of the progeny will be resistant or they'll be able to adapt. So marrying your sister, not a great idea. If you were on a desert island and you desperately, you know, if you were the last of humanity, yeah, you could have kids together. But when they all have kids together and their kids have kids together, bad stuff will happen. So we have done that over and over, though, haven't we? Not just with the Cavendish banana, but with all the types of wheat and the types of sugarcane. And, and so it's been the food model and the model for many, many years now. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these plants actually depend on us now in order to be able to uh, to reproduce. Uh, so we bred wheat. Uh, I mean, there is a bit of genetic diversity in wheat. It's not a complete clone, right? right. Uh, but uh, we have bred and bred and bred these things um, so that they all drop their seeds. Um, or, uh, so rather, rather they, they keep the seeds on the plant, which is the last thing a plant wants to do, but we want to harvest it. So we want the, plant, uh, the seeds to stay there. We've bred them in all sorts of ways. But that's, um, you know, what what's dangerous for us is if we lose the original uh, diversity that is in the wild relatives of those things that we've bred. So a lot of the work that Q does, for example, is in what are called crop wild relatives. And they've got these fantastic, um, you know, sort of tomato plants in Guatemala that are the progenitors of of, of Guatemala and uh, tomatoes. They're doing research on coffee and the original kind of coffee varieties and so on that that we've bred and bred and bred from since. Um, and and of course the uh, wild relatives of our our main crop cereal plants. Um, you know, so and those those piddling little plants that look like a, a boring bit of grass because obviously wheat is a grass. Those those are fantastically important if you want to go back and breed from them. Um, so terribly important that we we maintain the stocks of those around the world. Thank you, thank you. Um, Bat, you you showed us that slide saying this is the point my students go to sleep when they see the original Linnaean classifications. I mean, given that we know how ignorant i mean i know q's been doing a lot of work on funguses lately and just how many we don't know anything about that we haven't even discovered and that should know them i mean i don't want to use the word classified just understand them and appreciate them because 
that old saying, what you can't, you know, what you don't know, you can't value and what you don't value, you can't preserve. I'm sorry, you dropped out just at the critical moment. Would you mind repeating your question? Well, it just just to say, how, how do you think we should classify or not classify? But um, given that you know, we're in extreme danger of losing many species before we even know what they are, how would you, how would you as someone who, you know, you produce that slide of Linnaeus, what would you do? Um, I would say, number one, we should be extremely aware of the human-centric assumptions that we're forcing onto natural diversity, that there's an immensity of natural diversity out there, and we should always be questioning and questioning again all of these old concepts that we take for granted from two, three hundred years ago. And it's easily said, but it's not so easily done, because every single one of us who has gone through the traditional scientific education is, in a way, in slave to these concepts because that's how we get through the academic system. So maybe I'd like to pass that question over to Brigitte because I often think about how would my classification, my understanding of diversity, my record of diversity change if I were able to set aside my classification, my way of thinking, and maybe have a look at things more the way that traditional communities in Colombia do. That's that's great. Brigitte, pick that up because that's that's really interesting. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, the I think that classification and traditional classification or, or conventional scientific classification is good. It's it's pedagogic. It's easy for kind of a, for kids. But it, it, like if you if you are fond on on stamps on, on small cars because it's simple. But then you have to jump to more complex systems of classification, evolutionary classification, phylogenetics. Uh, but also you can create different types of, of classification systems, more perhaps more related to relationships. Because what do you, we want to preserve for the future is resilience and and ecosystem services and functions. And so what we want to keep together is. Uh, different communities and types of beings that is keep interacting while they evolve. You cannot just take a picture and pretend that that uh, answers everything in the world. So you can use many different types of classifications for different types of decisions and especially talk to politicians and to uh, policymakers to uh, teach them that they don't need to be attached just to one system of classification for anything. Uh, that, that they have advantages and disadvantages. So, I mean, I guess one of the things that follows out of that is that that saying, you know, that we won't get out of the mess by using the tools that got us into the mess. And I kind of like that as a thought, but I never quite know, you know, what, what in fact the answer would be to how we deal with the natural world. I mean, is it to keep doing interventionist things in the name of, I mean, protection and preservation of biodiversity or is it about just leaving it alone which I, I personally think we can't now with climate change but I don't know what do you think um, I think that an alternative answer to your question, Rosie, maybe lies in we sequence and assemble the full genomes and we use the word pan genomes mm -hmm. for collection of every single genome of a single species um, because sequencing technology is getting very cheap. So for little money, we can get glimpses into so much diversity, which is comparable and analyzable using artificial intelligence machinery. And at the same time, time as um, the more maybe arts, conversational, cultural approaches that Brigitte is talking about, we could use that technology alongside. I do believe that it's important to understand what we have on Earth before we let go of it. Mm -hmm. um, and as somebody who spent time a, a lot of time in Madagascar, and I've worked in Kenya and Tanzania, and at the same time, simply preserving the ecosystems that we have left is a non-negotiable priority as well. Um, Luke, how do you how do you react to the notion that we that we should classify, we shouldn't classify, and and when you when you talk about you know querying nature, what what can you say a bit more about that? Um, I I think that's very much a lay person. Um, 
there's almost a a, a, a a way that for the public nature can seem or the natural world or a forest can seem intimidating because we're expected to classify everything there's a there's a sort of feeling which i i found difficult we talk about the cultural space with nature writing in inverted commas where um if you don't know the names of all the plants or the trees or the birds or the fungi, then you're some you're some way failing. And I like the great mystery of it all to be able to walk around and not know what everything is. I find that very inspiring. And also now we have technology that enables us to use apps uh, to to sort of find out where everything is. And I and I've, I find that really sort of a joyous experience that learning and that mystery. And I think it's very important to to um instill that wonder in people and to allow as many people as possible to experience that i suppose maybe by qu querying nature i think could be a bit of a loose term but what i i see that as maybe as being is sort of disrupting this idea of nature as other than us as a, a space of of healing um uh in a sort of sentimental quite twee way I, I find quite extractive it's almost like logging you know you go into a forest and cut the trees down and you use them for for bit for making paper you go into forest and and it, you will take away your health and i think for me queering nature means that breaking down all these boundaries making the natural world more accessible connecting with ideas of of, of like Brajeev was talking about kind of indigenous people and how they used to interact with woodlands in the same way as well I love about Epic Forest that's you know the indigenous people of the Epic Forest area um the 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 people who worked that land they had incredible uh awareness of what they were doing and how it affected the biodiversity of that space just in a bit of woodland near London and I, and I think that's that's that it's just it's, it's this idea of making everything more complicated com more complicated and embracing that complexity yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, Brigitte talked about the cultural ways that we define nature. Um, Jonathan, how do you think that affects how you how you write about nature? I mean, you you made a sort of decision to do eighty plants, eighty trees, um, and we all know we all have cultural feelings about trees, but it is very important, isn't it, how nature gets talked about in politics, like the fact that the that ash tree was it an ash tree that was cut down in the gap. Um, it was it was a sycamore, but sycamore. Um, so everyone yeah, I gets mean, madly upset, and at the same time, we go on burning fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that makes me more madly upset, actually, is if you if you you've mentioned the P word, I'm afraid, and politics, um, really sort of, uh, you know, the, the, our system um, sort of encourages people to think in a binary way. Um, you know, we have this terrible adversarial kind of. Uh, political situation. I mean, it's even worse where I am at the moment in the United States, but it's going that way um, in in the UK, where uh, things which really shouldn't be um, party political have been turned into party political things. You know, environmental matters and so on, which are really it should be a coalition of people uh, sort of getting together to to be concerned about those things. And I think that one of the things that we could learn from nature, I was just looking through the Q&A and someone uh, mentioned, you know, sort of what, what can we learn in a way? And I, and I think what we, we could learn is, is you know, as, as Batya Kopilevich once said, you know, even a pyjama with only one leg still has two sides to it. And <laughs> I think that, you know, what we learn from nature is that everything is nuanced. Um, nothing is just two sides, actually. It's more than that. And, you know, you look at any kind of political situation and you try and sort of put it in black and white, which is the, the way that our media and our politicians have gone. Um, and that's just terrible because life is not black and white. You know, it's it's uh, it's silly to think of those things in black and white and uh, and in a binary way. And so the thing that I think that we should learn most culturally from nature is, is that life is complicated. Life is really complicated. And as soon as you think there's a black and white answer, a binary answer to something, it's probably not the right one. That's a really good, really good thought. And in fact, I mean, why don't you, it'd be nice to get everyone to respond to that idea about what we learn from nature. So Pat, what would you say, what we can learn in response to what Jonathan said? So nature is idiosyncratic, nature is weird, nature is unexpected, nature is crazy complicated. 
so many things are happening in nature. So whichever assumption or question or binary we have in our heads, when we go looking for it in nature, we are going to find it. Pretty much anything we search for is going to be found there in the natural process, in evolution, in natural diversity of organisms somewhere. So it's great fun, but also let's be a little bit careful because just because we're seeing it in nature doesn't mean it has any relevance for human society or future or our own identities. That's interesting. And Luke, how would you answer that question? And then I'll come to Brigitte Lark. Yeah, um, the, uh, people might have seen a famous clip of the filmmaker and writer Werner Herzog uh, in, in with his moustache in the in a jungle when it, um, he was making one of his films, and and he he talks about how nature here is vile and base. There is nothing erotical here. There is just death and fornication and rotting away, and 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 it's just sort of seen as Werner Herzog being this sort of miserable Werner Herzog. Whereas for me, this is a really liberating thing i think that that's what life is is fornication death and rotting away and the, and then the birth of new life you know now the leaves will be falling off the trees everywhere where a leaf has fallen off a twig there's another bra a, l- a little tiny bud there and i think that's a really beautiful thing that we're all part of this great churning cycle of fucking and death and what could be better than that really well that's that's, that's also pretty good um pretty Come on in and that, that's, that's and really pull, all the, pull all these different strands together for us. Um, what I would like to, to say is that you just blink your eyes and the world is different. And that's uh, amazing because you really cannot uh, um, see the future. You can perhaps approach what's going what's gonna to happen in the next minute. And that's why uh, understanding the growing nature of nature it's so important that you, you, you can be comfortable if you accept that this change is happening everywhere, every minute, everything is becoming twisted, it's becoming everything shifts, slides, makes noise, different things and weird things, as, as, as Pat says. Uh, and, and so you have to be looking everything at every moment. That's life. To you enjoy life while life happens. So you don't try to stop life to understand life. Great. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. I'm afraid we've now come to the end, but I feel extremely illuminated and thinking about things in different ways, which is what these sessions are all about. Um, We've got our event just announced on the 20th, which is our next one on, which is going to be about inspiring young adventurers and activists. Um, Tori Sui, Charlie Herzog Young and Phoebe Smith. And join us for that conversation. It's online now. And thank you very much to to Bat, Maria, John and Brigitte for just being completely brilliant. Details of all your books are in the chat. Thank you for the audience for sending in um, events with us, uh, questions with us, and as always, being such a great audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single question, but I hope that you've had a good time. I certainly have, and good night. Bye. Bye.